for the invitation to talk this evening. It's a great honour to be the first speaker in what I gather may be a series of uh, memorial talks in honour of uh, Peter Hoare's work. And um, you know, I'm very honoured to be able to start this, um, what I hope is a series of lectures off. And with the first one, what I thought I would do is cover a broad sweep of our earliest prehistory, the first million years of humans in Britain. And this may be the sort of foundation for a series of other talks which may focus in a bit more detail on, on some of the sites that I'm uh, going to be talking about. Um, the talk reflects the um, contribution of many, many people, and I've listed um, uh, some below my name on the title slide, and I'm, I'm delighted to see Simon Lewis is with us this evening. He worked very closely with Peter um, over the last 15 years, and um, uh, is very much responsible for much of this work that I'm going to be talking about. So, and um, thank you to my other colleagues, um, particularly Simon Parfit, Peter himself, uh, Rob Davis, and Chris Stringer, and there are many others. Um, it take too long to mention them by name, but the, these are projects that have been running for um, 15, 20 years under the umbrella of the Ancient Human Occupation of Britain project, and most recently, the Pathways to Ancient Britain project. Um, and this, of course, is in memory of Peter 
geologist, archaeologist, and as you all know, local historian. Um, the talk really divides into three parts, which are uh, um, the first part, stage one, is when we're pioneering populations trying to colonize northern Europe, including Britain. The second part is reflects it also reflects developments. It's going to be the short because we have the least information from that period, and that's because people were here but for much shorter periods of time, smaller populations, and uh, that's reflect reflected in the data. Um, we have. So I'm going to finish the talk off fairly quickly on what we can call stage three of our early prehistory. Um, you can see the sort of jagged line going down, sort of orange on the right and blue on the left. And this reflects the climate change that um, the world has experienced over the last million years. And you can see the number of warm periods that we have on the right and the number of cold periods that we have on the left. And this is very much determined humans getting to Britain, um, both in terms of uh, temperature, cold winters, um, Arctic winters at times, or um, warmer conditions, but also it's affected sea level. And talk is very much going to reflect those geographic changes that Britain has undergone, and the effect that that has had on the earliest populations. Don't worry about the rest of the detail, um, because I'm sure you can't read it. Um, so when we first started the projects, we had these early sites in Southern Europe, Atapuerca, Orthe in Spain, Piro Nor in Italy, Dominici in Georgia, all dating to well over a million years ago. But for some reason, there seemed to be a gap in the evidence that we have in terms of Northern Europe. When we started the project back in 2000, um, there was this significant gap. And the big question was, why did it take so long for humans to get into Northern Europe? Um, and we've been working on this problem for a long time. And were the problems uh, because of the marked climatic? Uh, was it due to long cold winters that we experienced in um, Northern Europe? And did, they, did early humans have the technology in terms of clothing, shelter, and fire? Um, and therefore, if they were, um, in Northern Europe, they're probably more reliant on animal resources because they had the hunting technology um, to acquire their food. So these are the questions that we are dealing with and still dealing with really um, through the projects. Um, this is a snapshot of uh, Britain and Northern Europe as it may have looked around about 700,000 years ago. And you'll see there are various geographic changes. For a start, we have this big land link uh, between Britain and Northwest um, Europe. So humans could get here, whether uh, temperature, sea levels were high or low. Um, the River Thames is flowing considerably further to the north. It didn't flow through its current valley in London, but uh, flowed through the Vale of St. Albans and out into the North um, Sea, considerably further north than it does today. But also there's this extinct river that then existed called the Bison River, which flowed from the Midlands and brought down courses and port sites and can trace the course of that river flowed across East Anglia, the wash basin didn't exist at this point, and flowed across East Anglia into the North Sea Basin. This river is now extinct, but part of our story uh, reflects the archaeology and the geology of that river system. That's how uh, Britain may have looked around about 700,000 years ago. Um, one thing to bear in mind, and it's had a huge impact on the story, The ocean, um, but it also left deposits which act as a very useful marker horizon, allow us to date sites to either before this event or after that event. And so, again, bear this in mind when we go through um, our, the story of our early prehistory. Um, those glacial, glacial deposits we can actually see on the Norfolk and Suffolk coast. Those cliffs are formed of those glacial sediments. So you can see how thick you're dealing with you know, 10 meters or more of glacial sediments. So anything underneath those cliffs predates that big glacial event. And this is a typical sunny day on the Norfolk coast. Um, they're particularly well exposed at West Runton. Here you have uh, sediments underneath those cliffs. You've got the glacial tills and um, so on 
up um, towards the top, these dating to 450,000 years ago, the angling glaciation. So underneath, you have the Cromer forest bed. And the Cromer forest bed is a series of uh, river sediments, estuary sediments, uh, near shore sediments, and rich in organic matter. Uh, fantastic preservation of bone and plant materials. And so if you're going to look for early humans, this is a fantastic place to look, um, preserving all this information. And until 2000, there were no confirmed artifacts from Chroma Forest Bed formation. It's not just a single horizon, it actually uh, reflects one and a half million years of um, uh, geological time. And so a hugely complex series of uh, river systems and estuary systems coming in and out. So reflecting massive period of time. And a lot of the project has been focusing um, on this body of sediment. And here is Peter indeed examining some of that sediment at, um, I think it's East Runton, um, earlier on in the project. And he was very involved with this part of the work. Um, Crown Forest Bay, you can see extending in patches from Georgia in the south and right the way to uh, around to Haysborough in the middle and around to West Runton and um, Sheringham in the north. And it's really Haysborough in the middle that um, I'm going to uh, focus on for the, benefit, uh, for the purpose of this talk. Um, this is Haysborough, actually several sites at Haysborough, um, but it's really uh, all that I want to uh, concentrate on. There's probably offshore sites. Um, in the past, we've turned them site five. There are probably several sites, so, and we don't actually know where they are. So putting the dot there is, is a little bit of fiction, but, um, um, but there are sites out to sea as well, but it's site three that we want to really focus on. Um, and we've had a whole range of uh, work at the site, both excavation programs, um, again, with which Peter was involved, and also offshore work, which Rachel Bino from Southampton University is um, continuing to work on. They were actually out there this summer. Uh, I'll be seeing Rachel on Thursday to hopefully catch up with some of the recent results. Um, so, site three land, and here, uh, looking down from the cliff on the foreshore, you can see typical chroma forest bed sediments, the most dark organic muds uh, preserving wood and other um, organic biological remains. Uh, obviously, we look out for any worked wood so far, it's just driftwood, no obvious signs of um, stone uh, wooden tools. Um, and the sea sometimes behaves. Um, there was one year where it, um, it was. Um, rain coming down from the sky, sea came over the sand uh, bank that we'd created. It was um, coming in from the sections at the side and also running down the cliff. So uh, water from four directions was very difficult to control. But through hard work, pumping, cleaning, and so on, um, we get the sections that we require. And it's a typical archaeological excavation in terms of recording the, the uh, sections, the geological sections, uh, taking samples, coring, and so on. Um, but no, these very hard grained laminated sediments, top left and silver, um, uh, geological deposits that we have at the site. And here you can see them again. So, very, very broadly speaking, we've got sands and Base sometimes these are marine, and you have these river gravels, these fluvial gravels, and above that, you have these estuary sediments. And they're fantastic. And a code of the river, we think we're dealing with a large river flowing probably more or less north. Um, the coast at this point um, goes um, heads from the southeast to the northwest. So, the river we think is pointing more or less north. Um, and we're able to look at um, the stones that are brought down by that river. You get the courses and quartzites from the Midlands. Um, you, interestingly, you get things like Harkshire pudding stone um, and you get um, green sand chert. And the explanations to explain how these um, exotic mythologies from not from East Anglia at all got into this river system is that we're dealing with an early. Uh, uh, course of the River Thames that flowed more or less through Haysborough at this time. And there are also exotic 
across. Um, I put a big question mark towards South Wales. Originally, we thought they were from South Wales, but this was something that Peter pursued um, relentlessly, um, talking to specialists across Europe, um, mainly in Britain, but also um, colleagues in Scandinavia. We never actually did track down the source of these rocks. They don't appear to be um, from South Wales. At one point, they thought to be from North Wales, and that doesn't seem to be the answer. So we're, there's still a big question mark as to where these rocks came from, but somehow they got into the this um, river system at Haysborough. And um, because we're dealing with early course of the Thames, we named Haysborough, Haysborough on the Thames, um, North Norfolk district, um, council um, uh, seem to have a loss of human, whipped it down the following day, which was very disappointing. The villagers loved the Haysborough on Thames. This information to gain with pine cane, that's not it. Genuine beetle from the site. We have fantastic beetle record, like the hyena copyright, all contributing. But we also can produce a sort of generalized um, pollen diagram. So I suddenly realize there's a quite big delay between my slide and the slide behind. So if I'm talking about stuff you can't look at, don't worry, we'll be with you soon. Um, so we have this schematized uh, pollen diagram, this column um, on the right hand side, where you can see the um, the red on the left, uh, which represents uh, deciduous forest, and the green in the middle, that coniferous forest. And as you go through the schematic section at the site, you can see how coniferous forest is taking over from uh, deciduous woodland. And so we interpret this as being a cooling in climate, probably towards the end of one of these warm periods, towards the end of um, uh, this interglacial we're dealing with, alongside all this other biological data. I'll pause too long. Uh, it will be with you shortly. Um, we have a reconstruction. Oh, that's a long time. Here we have a reconstruction of Haysborough as it may have looked uh, all that time ago uh, with all these exotic creatures. And the uh, creature you can see sort of um, on the left hand. I, I call this the comedy elf. It's got these ridiculous with these. That's what they did look like. Uh, so bear in mind the comedy elf, because that helps with the dating. And all these other um, um, uh, extinct creatures, so very early form of mammoth, um, beaver, extinct elf, extinct horse, and so on. A rich range of fauna, which helps with the dating. Um, so we did a large, what we think is an early course of the Thames. Um, from the pollen, we think we're dealing with the Grassland Valley, surrounded by coniferous uh, forests. We've got large herds of deer, horse, mammoth, um, rhino, and so on. Uh, tell us about uh, moderately warmer to stand here today, somewhere between 16 to 18 degrees centigrade. But winters were considerably cooler. Um, East Anglian winters today average around about three or four degrees. And these were somewhere between uh, minus three and zero. So three, uh, possibly more degrees colder than present, which makes quite a big difference. In terms of um, uh, modern day parallels, you're really talking about either Northern Germany or um, Southern Scandinavia. Um, so you can imagine they, they have pretty good summers, but their winters are distinctly colder than Britain. Um, and of course we have flint artifacts, representing humans. So how did humans survive these cold winters? And we have them occurring at several horizons. It wasn't just a one-off visit. A sort of picnic from France. This was, um, they were probably here for several generations. And here are examples of stone tools. Very few of them, there were only 80 um, artifacts from the site. And they're all simple cores and plates. Very simple technology, but very fresh in condition. They haven't been moved downstream at all. They're more or less in situ, and therefore representing humans actually at the site. Um, but it's not the only evidence of humans that we have. Um, in 2013, we were working with some of our Welsh colleagues, uh, Martin and Richard Bates, and we we're doing some uh, on the form at that time. And you can see these laminated sediments um, in the middle of the slide. I must remember there's a big delay. Um, and here in a minute, you'll be able to see um, 
examples of these laminated sediments um, with, uh, and normally they're sort of flat in disposition. You can see these sort of layers coming through, but this one area had this patch of uh, this very interrupted surface with these elongated um, hollows, um, some of which appear to be sort of wider at one end and narrower at the other, and some had a concave edge. And it uh, took us a while to really fully appreciate that these were almost certainly early human footprints. Um, and they weren't recent human footprints, these are solid segments you can jump up and down and make little impact. These were old hollows created, we think, by early humans. And we recorded this by multi-image. Uh, University of um, 3D uh, first came through to the office uh, sent by email. But I really first believed here to be it. First believed the um, early human footprints. I was able to analyze these and look at the orientation of them, the size of them, and came to the conclusion that you're um, dealing with a range of different sizes that probably reflect the family groups so that you have children, you have adults, and you can look at the orientation and um, they appear to be heading more or less um, in a southerly direction. So how old are these stone tools, these flint tools, and these footprints? Um, there are various ways of dating them. Um, if you look at the um, sediments, the estuary sediments at the site, we can use what's called uh, paleomagnetics, which um, studies the um, orientation of the minerals within the sediment, which rotate according to the site. And we appear to be dealing with a period as white bar in the middle. I don't know whether you can see my cursor or not. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. This white bar here. Um, this is a period of reversal when compasses would have pointed south. And we appear to be dealing with one of those periods. But we can also delimit the dating of the site through um, the animal zone. So we have this extinct form of um, mammoth, um, early form of mammoth, and extinct form of horse, um, which um, first died out in the record around about 800,000 years ago. So that provides an upper limit to the age of the site. And then we also have that comedy elk. This is where the comedy elk is important. And things like red deer that first come into the record around about a million years ago. So we can bracket the age of the site um, by dating it in that way. So somewhere between um, a million and 800,000 years ago, which is by far the earliest site in Northern Europe. Um, and we can say a little bit more about it. Uh, if you can see these two peaks in the diagram, we think we're dealing with a, a cooling climate. So that cooling limb either there or either there which would uh, provide um, more precision to the data than either 950,000 years ago or possibly 850,000 years ago. We can't really distinguish between those two ages. Um, this received wide publicity um, in the journal Nature. There was a nice bit of xenophobia from the sun, um, erudite comments from the Times, British civilization began in Norfolk, um, and tongue in cheek comments from the Guardian, meet the Norfolk relatives. And, and then downright, um, downright lies from the Daily Mirror, those people in Norfolk Gate Hughes. <laughs> and um, so received wide publicity in uh, 2014 and, and the earlier work as well. Um, so the big question is, who were they? Um, unfortunately, we have no human bone from Britain itself. So we have to rely on um, parallels from further afield. And the nearest site is Atapuerca in Northern Spain. And, there we're dealing with a similar age site, around about 800,000 years ago. They have um, a lot of the skeletal evidence um, of this homo antecessor uh, with males standing upright about five foot nine, females about five foot three, the brains slightly smaller than uh, ours. Um, and they did actually practice cannibalism. So I assume that's where the Daily Mirror got their headline from. And what's nice about footprints is, footprints and there's a ratio of 15 footprint size and stature 
that works for both today, uh, different populations of humans today in the past, different species of humans. Even. And um, the estimate of height from the footprints was uh, the biggest were male about my height, the, um, I like to think five foot nine, but probably not quite. Five foot eight, maybe, on a good day. And um, similar height to myself, and foot size about UK size eight, and that conforms exactly with the evidence that we have from Antipuerca in northern Spain. So there's quite a nice relationship there. Um, so the questions we're still asking, how do humans deal with these long cold winters? Seasonal migration, we think this is highly unlikely because um, it's all very well for fully fit hunters or um, early humans to you know, um, extend their range into, into Britain, but it's not a, something the family would do for several generations. In one earth would you go back? Um, were they physically adapted? We don't know. Maybe they had um, better insulation through body hair than um, we have today. Or did they have better technology, clothes, shelter, fire? And we can't really answer those questions yet, but we're still trying to find our answers. And, and this work will continue over the next few years or longer. Um, so uh, we come to the next period. And um, so we have all this evidence from the coast. And to move in equivalent evidence of slightly later. Um, one of the major pieces of work that Simon Lewis has been undertaking for how many years, Simon? A lot. <laughs> many. <laughs> And also through the duration of the project, um, and it's come to fruition now in um, form of well, uh, various publications in the past, and then two big publications uh, that have come out recently. So this is very much a reflection of Simon's work and uh, our contributions towards that. So um, the Python River flowed from the Midlands across East Anglia, um, I think probably to the north of Ely, um, and then out to the North Sea. But it's particularly well represented um, in the sort of Milden Hall, Thetford, or, or sort of Breckland um, uh, part of the river system. And this is work um, that was a large Breckland Paleolithic project over the road from the north. Um, remember the wash didn't exist at this point, flowed down south from Feltwell, down and around the river side, it's uh, uh, Spring Oak, Mace Cross Hill, High Lodge, Warren Hill, Rampart Field, Sapperston, and so on. So these are in the Now, recognizing um, sediments from this river is reliant on recognizing the courses and court sites that are brought in from the Midlands. And a lot of the work has been identifying um, sites with that particular uh, range of rocks. And Simon, through his previous distribution, look at their heights, and what you, it doesn't have a single course, three times it's cut lower, lower courses, uh, normally during glacial periods, it'll cut a new course, be an abundance of water during um, melts and thaws, and you'll get lower river courses being cut, you get the staircase of river courses created through time. I think Apologies of courts and court sites, map walls roughly represent a sort of glacial interglacial cycle. Well, that's the sort of current thinking. So, if you start at the bottom, of course, the lowest course is the latest, and this is uh, Warren Hill. And you get go up this series of steps, up a series of river terraces until you get to the top, and you're dealing with a considerably earlier period of time, perhaps half a million years earlier. Um, one of the sites that we um, particularly concentrated on was the site of Warren Hill, that's just outside Barton Mills, and you can see the extensive work that was undertaken there, and Peter was very much involved with this work, uh, right the way through the years 2013-16, that was the main concentration of the work, and I, I, I did a quick summary, you can see the map, I'm sure you can't read it. Thing, but it shows where all the dots represent where you know, we had interventions of one sort or another. But there are 18 test pits, 14 boreholes, 10 dating samples, 59 stone counts. And this is really where Peter made a major contribution. Uh, so 
Peter's perseverance and the well, both skill and perseverance to be able to do that. It's probably the largest stone came anywhere, I think. I mean, it's an astonishing amount, but it provides really important information for the interpretation, not just Warren Hill, but other sites um, in the Breckland um, Bison system. Um, and um, Peter didn't only um, count stones, he also was active in terms of some of the um, field works. So, he didn't walk away from any task, something sometimes he should have done, but he didn't. Here he is digging a section. Um, we also had uh, part of this uh, a dating program and um, uh, working with a French team, and it was the lowest three terrace uh, remnants that we could um, date. These uh, have supported the geological interpretation of the site. And we think Warren Hill is very much intimately involved with the end of the Bison River. This was the last expression, just prior or just at the beginning of this angry glaciation about 450,000 years ago. And the dating work with French colleagues um, supports this interpretation and supports these earlier and earlier dates, for these different um, terrace steps. Um, and we can uh, put those dates on the um, terrace steps themselves, and you probably can't see the detail there. But the important thing, certainly from my angle, and I think many other people's angles, this is one of the best river systems in which we can begin to look at um, uh, when humans were here, what sort of artifacts they were producing when they were here through a long period of time. Early situation bottom foreign hill deposits, and with those were associated these rather fine ovate shaped hand axes. Next terrace up, we have these more pointed, hard hammer made hand axes, slightly cruder. And above that, um, in two terraces above that, you have um, occasional occurrence of simple cores and quakes. So here you're beginning to map. We've also different. These are examples. Um, Better, um, see, or clearly, examples of uh, random fields 600,000 years ago, and slightly more refined hand axes from sites like Warren Hill, which also high lodge, date to 500,000 years ago. Um, and one of the other pieces of work that uh, Peter was involved with was providing a relationship between high lodge and Warren Hill. High Lodge is a fantastic site where you have bison floodplain serpents preserving fantastic archaeology. All these other sites are gravel sites where the artifacts have moved. High Lodge, you have a situation of in situ archaeology. You can see some of the flint scatters in the bottom right hand side. Um, and Warren Hill, we were getting these clay lumps that were armored with the, that sort of grand. At the time, they looked remarkably similar to. Um, the sediments that we get at High Lodge, which is only one kilometre to the north. And indeed, if you look at the sand, silt, and clay composition of those sediments, they're remarkably similar to uh, from High, um, Warren Hill, they're remarkably similar to the sediments that we get at High Lodge. So we think one is derived from the other, and that provides a stratigraphic relationship, which shows that High Lodge must be earlier than Warren Hill. And High Lodge itself, um, we get uh, these fantastic, very fresh conditions scrapers that were produced um, because we um, uh, have evidence of dating from the biological information, but also now the relationship with Warren Hill, we can say with some assurance that these scrapers from High Lodge date to 500,000 years ago. And again, Peter was very much involved with Simon with that work. Um, High Lodge itself is contemporary with the amazing site of Fox Grove, uh, where we have Human remains. This is um, a site on the towards the south coast near Chichester. Uh, again, very similar hand axes to those we find at High Lodge. It's also evidence of humans. Um, the original thinking was that it's probably Homo heidelbergensis. Um, a paper which is not yet published um, is veering towards it perhaps being more like very very early Neanderthal. That's not in the public domain yet. So you're the first to hear it. Apart from the researchers. Don't breathe a word. Um, so 
by this time, by the time of 500 years, we're getting more sites, richer sites, we're getting amazing artifacts occurring, we're getting evidence of humans. And this is really part of the second period that I'm talking about, where um, stage two, with these large sites, we're almost certainly dealing with larger populations of people. Um, they're much more within their comfort zone. They're staying here for longer periods of time. They're leaving more rubbish, more artifacts behind. And but interrupting this period, we have this big glaciation of the Anglian. So even though people are com comfortable here, they must have been treated during the glaciation and then um, recolonized after the end of the glaciation uh, about 400,000 years ago. And um, glaciation also had a major impact on the geography of Britain. Here are three sort of very simple maps showing um, a period we call late Cromerian 500,000 years ago. This is contemporary with uh, both High Lodge, Warren Hill and Botsgrove. And at this time you had chalk, and that's this first map you had chalk running between Kent and Northwest France. Chalk Ridge, that you can now they see in the uh, cliffs of Dover and the equivalent on the other side. The Anglian glaciation blocked uh, the North Sea to the north. So the ice descended, um, blocked uh, the sea to the north. Um, any water within that system, within the southern North Sea basin, was also blocked by the chalk to the same. So we have what we call a pro-glacial lake building up in the southern North Sea Basin. And that filled up, particularly as, uh, with meltwaters and so on, towards the end of the glaciation, we think that filled up, filled up, filled up, but reached probably 35, 40 metres. And at that point, it tipped over, it's high enough to tip over the chalk, uh, the chalk ridge that ran between Kent and North West France and created very quickly uh, what we now call um, the Strait of Dover. So a massive channel catastrophic event creating um, the Strait of Dover, which as sea levels rose, became more and more significant. Um, so during the following warm period, 400,000 coming in through the Strait of Dover, the North Sea Basin, uh, the floor of the North Sea Basin is much higher um, than it is today, probably 40 metres higher, so more or less um, same height as modern day sea level. So you could still cross this area. So you still had access to Britain. But over the last 400,000 years, the floor of the North Sea Basin has subsided. On average, probably 10 meters every 100,000 years. So through time, every warm period, even if you had high sea levels, access to Britain became more and more difficult. And I'll come on to that later in, on in the talk. So major um, this glaciation had a major impact on uh, British geography and the ability of humans to get here. But um, during this Hotsdam interglacial 400,000 years ago, we have an amazing array of sites uh, across southern and eastern England. Swanscombe in the south, up to Elven, Barnum, Hotsdam, Beaches Pit and so on, um, and Clacton uh, in East Anglia. Um, and we have a great array of evidence. We have um, this wooden spear from Clacton dating to this period. Uh, we have evidence of fire at Beaches Pit. Uh, we have these wonderful tools, hand axes on the field for general purpose book. Uh, we have the from, and we also have a human skull from Swanton. Um, and this time, the human skull is thought undoubtedly to be uh, very early in the So, 400,000 years ago, we had very early in the in Britain. Um, and again, the Breckland is very rich in sites that date to this period. And there, there are three sites, uh, four sites that we've been dealing with, Elfton, uh, Beach's Pit, Devereux's Pit, uh, which I think Rob Davis may have talked to you about uh, two years ago, um, and Barnum. And it's Barnum that we've really been focusing on in the last, uh, over the last um, eight years. Um, set in farmland just to the south of Thetford, an old clay pit. Um, clay pit has a long history, but particularly expanded uh, when Eastern Hall burnt down um, around about 1904. Um, so clay was dug from the clay pit to make bricks uh, to, for the rebuilding of Eastern Hall. And then various excavations, and we ourselves did some work for uh, between 1980, 
I4, but we returned to the site in 2013, again with Peter's help. Um, it's a nice place to work, and uh, much drier than um, Haysborough, or at least on Peter, generally dry. Um, so there are various um, trenches around the edges of the pit and within the middle of the pit. In terms of the geology, we're dealing with two main uh, blocks of sediment. We've got this very deep channel, which is full of angling glacial sediments. And then above that, you've got Hoxnian interglacial sediments. And the Hoxnian interglacial sediments are the infillings of a small pond or lake, and actually go down some, something like five meters in the middle of, of the pit, so quite deep and preserve fantastic environmental information. And those sediments thin towards the edges of the pond, in the depression, and at the edge, um, you have this uh, gravel exposed, and the gravel formed the raw material um, for the manufacture of stone tools. So in the middle, you have these deep sediments, which uh, contain all the environmental evidence. And at the edges, you have uh, the gravel and human artifacts, um, where the humans. So trying to link those two things together has been uh, part of the project work. Um, so you can see, you think probably flowing from um, east to west, um, maybe a seasonal stream, maybe something slightly bigger, and in filling this, it is little more than a pond, um, but filling with rich organic materials. And here's a bit of sort of industrial archaeology. You can actually see the edges of the uh, brick pit, um, uh, the clay pit diggers, um, holes that have dug out the clay to, uh, the manufacture of bricks, and they left, fortunately for us, these big bulks of sediment, these grey clays, which are both useful for recording the geological sections within them, but also um, uh, excavating them and sieving them. And um, Simon O'Connor here at the front has been very heavily involved in the sieving of the many tons. Of this um, large uh, zoological remains. Um, this is the uh, sieving program, huge buckets being soaked, soaked and so on. And the results from this work and various other sampling of the site has produced a fantastic environmental record uh, for understanding of the um, sequence um, through the Hotsmian glacier. You get um, everything from pollen to small bowls, um, macaque teeth there on the right um, shells, and so on. And you get the larger bones, things like. Uh, European pond in the top left, a range of different deer, um, particularly large cats, probably a lion, possibly a saber toothed cat of some sort, but one and a half times larger than African lions today. Um, some of the bone has cut marks, so you know that um, humans were um, butchering the bone at this location. Together, we can produce this picture of uh, with particularly large elephant, straight tusk elephant, um, lion, uh, range of different animals in the background, and uh, indeed humans around this waterhole, um, which would have been ideal for uh, hunting down or scavenging um, game and so on, as well as providing fresh water and other resources. But it's around the edges of the pit that we have the main archaeological evidence in terms of stone tools. Um, and here is one of the areas under excavation. I'll find it in a minute. Um, and what we discovered through the recent work is that we're dealing with two distinct human groups with different forms of plate tools. The first group has simple core and plate assemblage, no apparent evidence of hand axes. The second group has simple cores and plates, but also um, they're making hand axes. So we think these are two different populations of humans coming in um, to Britain um, with a fairly short time, period of time separated. And this is really interesting in terms of how human groups are moving around Europe at this time. Um, and you can trace these two, say, assemblage types across the site from uh, between the various areas. Um, so you have area four and area six on the left, uh, through to area one, um, area three, 
which is where the main environmental evidence is coming from, and also to another area over to the west area of five. So the, the pattern is consistent with these two different human populations coming into the site and using the small um, water hollow um, uh, or combination of things, whether it be food, water, or so on. Um, and um, here you can see examples of some of the artifacts of the two distinct human groups, um, simple plates and cores and hand axes on the right. Um, associated with the second human group, the ones who are making the hand axes, we also have evidence of burning. Um, and this is in the form of some charcoal, uh, burnt flint. Um, some of the burnt flint is actually burnt artifacts. Um, we also have uh, small amounts of burnt bone. Um, and this year, for the first time, we think we found burnt sediment. So the big question is, is this um, natural fire? Is this a forest fire sweeping through the site? Or are we actually dealing with human use of fire. If we're dealing with human use of fire, this is um, one of probably four sites across Europe. We have fire use at this time. So really exciting evidence um, by use uh, by various sites in Europe for this evidence and all production of this. And this is something that working on until um, COVID happened and everything else happened, uh, eager to uh, use a new technique, a new technique to us called FTIR. Uh, um, and uh, coming down occasions and developing um, technique. And, um, and you can begin to estimate temperatures um, from this. And we were able to compare results um, from actual archaeological um, uh, materials to ones that were produced through experimental programs. So begin to build up a database of um, uh, providing stronger evidence for human use of testing that, that idea. And this is work that will um, continue in the future. It's been sort of on the whole for 18, but obviously involved with. So it'd be great to see that work taken to fruition over the next few years. Um, and of course, the evidence that um, Barnum, if it is human use of fire, will be contemporary with the evidence that we have at the nearby site of Beaches. Um, what we're also able to do is really through um, the detailed polymer <laughs> evidence that we have, we're able to correlate um, Barnum with a series of other sites, beaches, as I've just mentioned, but also other sites in Southeast England um, in a much more detailed way than you can um, in mainland Europe. So correlating Barnum and beaches, Tonston, Clacton, Ops and other sites across um, East Anglia and uh, Southern England, and also potentially with um, a couple of French sites. Um, and uh, this is again important for understanding how these early human populations operate. I mean, what are they doing in Britain? When are they coming to Britain? Where are they? Uh, so we've got these um, the green dots represent the core industries, people with this sort of fairly simple technology um, without the, for some reason, the use of hand axes. And the red dots represent people with the use of hand axes. And you have a third group coming in where you get these very fine and what we call two ovate axes. Um, are coming in much, much later on warm period and the Thames Valley, which have these remarkably fine, very elegant um, twisted ovates. And you can see how they have a twist in profile down one side. If you turn the hand axe to 180 degrees, you can see the same twist 
um, on the other profile. So we seem to have three population groups coming into Britain. And one of the questions is, um, where do they come from? Um, presumably they're coming from Europe somewhere. And again, one of the big questions of the research projects is trying to understand these population incursions into Britain and which bits of Europe, um, where are the source areas, these three different phases of human incursion. And uh, there are numerous sites across Europe, but in Britain, we're having a much more detailed record for this period and able to provide much more uh, greater resolution to the data, which we're unable to do at the moment in Europe. So questions for the future. We then come to the final period, and this part of the talk will be much more brief, partly because we have far less evidence, partly because um, populations we think are much smaller, um, Visitation is much more brief. This is stage three of the talk when uh, at times Britain is an island, at times a peninsula of Northwest Europe. Um, and what we can see is that through successive interglacial, so we have the Hotskin, which is 400,000 years ago, next interglacial, roughly about 300,000 years ago, um, uh, two interglacials further on, um, the last interglacial is about 125,000 years ago. What we can see is that as the North Sea, the floor of the North Sea basin subsided, it became more and more difficult to get to Britain um, during high sea levels, during warm periods. Um, those links were being, and this is reflected in the archaeological evidence we have. have. Um, what we can link between Britain and Northwest France, um, but Britain's far too cold for human habitation. Have this balance between um, cold climate when humans wouldn't be able to survive here. Um, as soon as climate ameliorated, uh, became warm, then it became much more difficult to get here. So there's a balance between these two different competing things that are also interrelated. And we can see this game's piece of work that Simon and I undertook um, oh, about 20 years ago. Um, we can actually um, look at, uh, take the uh, river Thames is a river system. We can, Thames like the Biathan, has different terraces, and we can look at the density of artifacts within those ten, um, terraces. Um, it's an area that is very well collected, so we have large collections from different sites through the Thames Valley from different terraces. And if you look at the densities um, in terms of terrace mapping, we can see that densities actually drop through time. It's a sort of reverse of what you'd expect. You'd expect populations to increase through time. Actually, populations drop through time um, from sort of 400,000 years ago through to 200,000 years ago when we think populations were virtually absent from Britain. Um, and one can sort of visualize this um, through this diagram. Um, these two thresholds that I was talking about one is the um, sea level. Um, which um, determines to some extent whether humans can get here or not. And we think the North Sea Basin is subsiding through time. So the upper blue line is a reflection of um, T, um, one of the thresholds. So if the curve is, is above that, then Hume, uh, Britain would have been an island. Um, parts of the curve below that line, Britain was a peninsula. Um, and then the green line is a sort of technological threshold, you know, humans coping with the cold. So again, if one uses the assumption that uh, human ability to uh, cope with cold conditions improve through time, then we're really dealing with parts of the curve that lie above that when climate is warm enough that humans can cope, and below that line when Britain was a part of, uh, or linked by land to Northwest Europe. Um, so these bits of the curve between these two lines represent time periods when Britain could be occupied or easily occupied. And as you can see, these red bars at the bottom represent those periods of time. And they get briefer and briefer from 400,000 years ago over here to uh, this period here, 125,000 years ago, when there are incredibly short periods of time when Britain could be occupied. This sort of little time period here, which is literally a couple of thousand years ago. And humans weren't quick enough. So what we find is, 
there's an apparent total absence of humans in the last interglacial in Britain. Um, and uh, this is reflected to some extent by the archaeological evidence, again, a project that Simon and I worked on, looking at all the environmental science of the last interglacial, uh, all the exquisition, and all these environmental sites, no evidence of human artifacts at all. Whereas across the other side of the channel, um, there are several sites, and of course, in Somme Valley is probably the most famous, they have very good evidence of humans. So clearly the channel is a major barrier to human occupation at this time. Um, and going back to this uh, diagram, you can see that 60,000 years ago, this is a brief episode of time when time is probably just about warm enough for humans to survive, maybe just since humans return. And this time we're dealing with um, sort of late Neanderthals, uh, 60,000 years ago. We have a smattering of science, not a huge number of science. Uh, Linford, um, just uh, north of uh, Munford, is one of the sites which came up recently. Whereas other sites around the country. And what we may be dealing with is literally summer incursions by hunters, still you know, reasonably. Um, cool summers, but distinctly cold winters. We're talking sort of you know, minus 10, minus 12 degrees over winter, which is probably too early, to, um, too cold for humans to survive. Um, and we also get um, slightly later sites, again, during the sort of block of time. Um, and this is a period of time when we're dealing with the very vast Neanderthals um, and probably the very earliest first modern humans around about 40,000 years ago. Um, it does appear to be in some sort of crossover, um, not necessarily in Britain, but certainly in Europe, when both species were present. Um, and these sites like Egan's, uh, Glaston, Kent's Cavern, um, the latter undoubtedly or it seems to have modern humans, Egan's and Glaston, we're not quite sure whether these um, artifacts were made by late Neanderthals or first modern humans, we don't know because we don't have the skeletal evidence, but it's around this period of time that you get this change over to one species and the next. And of course, what we shouldn't get is the rich remains coming out from Doggerland or the North Sea Basin and still material coming up. Uh, again, Simon's been involved in one of the projects um, where um, a sandscaping scheme to the north of Haysburg and also um, at Clapton, uh, large bodies, millions of tonnes of sand have been um, scraped up from the North North Sea Basin, dumped to replenish these beaches and provide better defences in, in terms of uh, north of Haysborough. Um, and um, most of the artefacts have been found within the sand that's been dumped from sort of um, within the North Sea Basin, dumped and artefacts are turning up. So, Again, we have that sort of link between um, artifacts being found on the coast that clearly come from uh, deep down in the North Sea Basin. So we mustn't get Doggerland or the North Sea Basin as being a rich area for humans um, during periods of um, low sea level. Humans were clearly using it. Uh, there was this um, marvellous map that was um, produced for a magazine called Modern Mechanics. Um, this is in the uh, 1930s with a, a scheme to build this enormous dam across the North Sea Basin from um, East Anglia across through to Denmark. An incredible scheme to um, build canals, railway links, and all the rest of it. And, uh, one wonders how that would have uh, transformed us today, but um, uh, never happened. And then we get the first modern Britons coming in um, around 11,000 years ago. Um, right at the end of the last glaciation. These are uh, direct ancestors, um, direct links between this population and many people who live in Britain today, Cheddar Man, we get various Mesolithic sites, Star Car, and so on. And, um, and then Britain finally became an island for the last time in its history and looked more or less as we um, see Britain today. And by this time during the Mesolithic period, um, getting the use of boats, active use of boats, and uh, Britain is effectively an island. And really a final slide just to illustrate uh, some of the more recent impacts of Britain being an island, and we obviously still live with that today. 
Um, so very, very quickly to summarize, we have stage one, we're dealing with pioneering populations struggling to cope with Northern Europe. We get these amazing sites like Haysburg. Um, then we get stage two, this rich period, rich sites, amazing evidence of fire, hunting, um, uh, elaborate tools and so on. And then you get this third stage where it became much more difficult to uh, when it's part of a peninsula conditions are simply too cold. Um, so that's a very rapid summary of the last million years, but I hope it forms a foundation for future talks. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of volunteers to give future talks on aspects of the work and aspects of the work that um, Peter was very much involved in. And, uh, we all miss him greatly. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Can you take a question or two? Yes. Do we have a question or two? Um, we, we fully accept that there's been dramatic change of time in the past, but the changes that are happening at the moment are, are many times um, more rapid um, than we've seen today. I mean, Simon, we can probably ask this, i just put you on the spot, answer this question much more effectively. And it's one of the courses you certainly taught in the past about climate change and the, the um, Right, uh, the question was whether climate change is, as we've seen in, in the deep past previously, or whether the, um, and whether the current change is simply part of that pattern, or whether there are much more dramatic changes. And I, I was back, or um, initially answered that the changes we're seeing at the moment are much, much more uh, dramatic than we've seen in the past, and Simon's going to elaborate on that. Which question do you think? Um, yeah. I think it was the, well, certainly one of them. Uh, I, think, I think there were probably many questions yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> enthusiasts for all kinds of things, but certainly one of the questions I know. Um, you know, a few months before he died, he was very keen to get back to this voluntary work looking at using FTIR, uh, a transform infrared. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's the fellow. 
Um, so he was very keen, he was developing his, his skills in the technique and beginning to come out with results which were looking promising. I think certainly that was one of the um, uh, questions that we would like to have got further with, you know, whether or not there's human use on um, It's incredibly important, question, something that it's not just a British focus, it's, it's a worldwide it's a, a big global question. When, Humans first developed fire. Um, you know, fire is important for all kinds of reasons, not just for cooking and so on, killing, um, uh, extending the life of food. Um, there are all kinds of um, social reasons why fire is important. Uh, suddenly you have a focus um, after daylight hours, it extends uh, the ability to work after daylight hours, but it also requires that focus, that social focus where um, I think it's highly likely that uh, suddenly you're having to communicate with people in a slightly different way. Not just about living, but it's also about maybe beginnings of storytelling, development of language, um, all these different things that are the fire of central to. And um, what's interesting is 500, 400,000 years ago, this corresponds to a time when human brains more or less reached uh, modern levels. Uh, around about so 1200, even approaching 1300 um, CC, which is not far off. And it, it's growth in the near cortex and memory part of the brain seems to be important. And so um, I think many researchers think that this is a critical threshold in human development and uh, language, communication, um, different types of social experience. Uh, uh, Changing at this point, far as central to them. Yes, yes, yes. I think certainly that's one of the probably many things that he would have liked to have got further with. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's our appreciation in the usual way. I'd like to just tell you about our next meeting, which is scheduled on Monday the 15th of November. Caroline Swan, she's going to tell us about some practice chapters and the what, how to 